Welcome to this month's episode of IDF Southeast Asia Facebook Live Voice of Diabetes Care. For our regular viewers, those who have been joining us every month, you would be aware that every month we come with interesting unmet needs and topics in the domain of diabetes care, especially from the region of Southeast Asia with a global perspective and regional perspective from experts across this region. In this special episode today, we are very, very happy to have with us two very exciting people, two individuals who needs no introduction, Dr. Bansi, Dr. Peter Swartz, who is the president of the IDF, and Dr. Bansi Sabu, who is the chair-elect of IDF Southeast Asia. Once again, a warm welcome to all our viewers at this special episode of IDF Southeast Asia. I will now invite my co-host, Dr. Rutul, to kindly introduce our two guests as we start the proceedings. Good evening, everyone again. So I would first introduce Dr. Peter Sors, who is uh, from Germany, Dresden, and uh, who is current president-elect as well as serving as a president, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, earlier just because uh, um, untimely uh, death of uh, our current president, who was our current president, Dr. Hussein, sir. Uh, so uh, he's president-elect of uh, International Diabetes Federation. He's international expert for the prevention of diabetes and first professor for prevention and care of diabetes in Europe. He has special training in Germany, USA, Tanzania, South Africa, Finland for MBA. Uh, he has done and uh, he has 292 peer-reviewed publications, total impact factor of 5034. So you can uh, understand his academic accolade. He is chair of strategic forum of self-care technology and digitalization at European Diabetes Forum, that is EASD and IDF uh, Joint uh, Forum. Uh, so uh, we have Dr. Peter Swas and another uh, panelist is Dr. Bansi Sabusa, uh, who is our uh, chairman elect for Southeast Asia region IDF. And he's also serving as Secretary of Diabetes India, which is also part of IDF. Uh, he is also Vice President of Diabetes in Asia Study Group, DASG. He is past President of RSSDI and IRO. And he has many publications. He, he needs no introduction more than that, that he is hero of uh, diabetes uh, in India, as uh, Peter Swartz was yesterday uh, int uh, introducing him. So with this, I'll hand over session to Dr. Ahmed. So again, so, a warm yeah. welcome to uh, both our star guests and to all our viewers out there. I'm sure many of us are quite excited to hear the visions of Dr. Peter and Dr. Sabu. And uh, also uh, at the IDF Southeast uh, Asia Voice of Diabetes Care, we intend to pick up those unmet needs from the voices in the community and deliver them at, to the public at large through the social media platforms. So also a request to all our friends who are joining us live today. If you have any comments or questions to Dr. Peter or Dr. Sabu, please feel free to write them in the chat box or in the comment section, and we will take them up on the live as we go forward. So before we start with a host of questions which most of our friends have sent for you, Dr. Peter and Dr. Sabu, uh, we would request Dr. Peter to present a few slides to start with, and then we will go into a question. So over to Dr. Peter. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Rufu, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And as Dr. Rufu had already, or Rufu already had said, it's actually a sad moment that I'm here because I was supposed to become president of the International Diabetes Federation in April next year. And uh, due to the unexpected uh, death of the current president, Professor Akhtar Hussein, I took over the presidencyship and the leadership of the International Diabetes Federation. And that's why I would like to take uh, a few minutes to indicate 
what is driving me and what are the goals under my presidentship for the International Diabetes Federation? Because the International Diabetes Federation is not a federation um, I'm leading and I'm doing the things. It's a federation of 242 and probably the end of the year, 260 member organizations. So it's a roof organization of nearly all big diabetes organizations in the world and um, uh, also patient organizations. So under the bottom line, this organization reached more than 500 million people with diabetes. And if you are honest, if you say we want to be member of the International Diabetes Federation and want to have an impact, then we should think about how can we reach this 500 million people with diabetes and do uh, or and act to improve quality of care. For me, serving IDF means prevention. And the second thing is prevention. And the third thing is prevention again, because this is where my heart is beating for, where my passion is. Because if we are honest again as physicians, we know what are the risk factors for diabetes. We know how the risk factors evolve. We can, we know the pathophysiology, but we still wait until we diagnose diabetes. And then we often have a diagnose-free interval from 10 to 15 years. And then we start treating a disease which started 25, 30 years earlier with its pathophysiology. So thinking about how can we become better and be preventive and enable prevention programs is important. And the second thing for me will be digitalization, using digital tools, digital therapeutics to reach patients where they are and provide better evidence-based care. Finally, building IDF as a strong, powerful organization. What is driving me uh, or where my passion is is addressing the need of our patients. And this need may vary a lot between different countries, like, for example, in India or in Suriname or Japan or Finland, but many of the needs are also in common. So being specific for the individual needs, but addressing the main needs of our patient, this is what is driving me. And if you ask why IDF, I think we need a powerful voice for people with diabetes and we need a powerful voice for modern, innovative treatment of people with diabetes. And this is, again, what is driving me. I truly believe that every person with diabetes in the world has a right to get an adequate diabetes treatment. And I uh, yesterday I shared the story where I met a father of a type 1 diabetes child in Congo, and he said um, it's very difficult for him because on a daily basis, he has to decide to buy the insulin for the child or the food for the rest of the family. As long as this situation exists, we have not fulfilled our task. So I think the mission of all of us should be to provide accessible and available high quality of preventive uh, and diabetes care. And this, again, is driving me as president of the International Diabetes Federation. I want to be in the brain or in the diary of every health care politician. I want to be in the pocket of every diabetes patient, and I want to be in the heart of every healthcare professional uh, treating people with diabetes in the world. How do I want to achieve this? Or how if the International Diabetes Federation uh, wants to achieve this? Uh, firstly, we will develop a global diabetes index, asking every year, every country, patients and physicians about their perception of the quality of diabetes care. We will translate this into an index and release all the information free on World Diabetes Day. And so then every stakeholder in the diabetes sector can see, okay, my country scores at maybe 64, but the neighboring country is 68. How can this be? And this may build a momentum for the Minister of Health to do something. Maybe it's ignoring the first year, but if in the second year we repeat this, and then in your country, the quality of care went down by 1% and the neighbor improved by 2%, then the momentum will become stronger. Secondly, I want to be in the pocket of every diabetes patient. If we ask who is today in the pocket of every diabetes patient, it's Google, it's Meta, it's Facebook, it's Instagram, it's uh, WhatsApp. Using this partners, so for example, discussing and working with Google and YouTube to develop a global free diabetes education strategy, uh, developing evidence-based content and qualified content, uh, which everyone can use for their own apps, but also IDF uses as an educational hub. 
could be a game changer for people with diabetes in terms of education. And thirdly, I want to be in the heart of every healthcare provider. How do we want to achieve this? And this is a big invitation to every one of you who is listening, become fellow of the International Diabetes Federation. So I want to invite every healthcare professional who's treating people with diabetes to become fellow of the International Diabetes Federation. And what are you getting back from it? You will access all educational, professional education content from the IDF School of Diabetes for free as IDF fellow. You will get discounts on the Congress and we get multiple additional um, um, uh, feedback and things back if you uh, register yourself as a fellow of the International Diabetes Federation. And if you wait a second, there's a QR code coming and I will later on post this QR code also in the chat and um, then you can register yourself that you are interested for the fellowship, because officially the fellowship starts in six to eight weeks um, um, for IDF. We will combine this with a global research strategy to address unmet uh, needs in research and also a global education strategy. And this will be the IDF School of Diabetes. And how will this look like? Here is an, an example how the new IDF School of Diabetes will look like. So imagine there are about 1,000 modules of courses, all levels of diabetes care for the healthcare professional, starting from the very basic things up to how to program an AID system for a type 1 diabetes patient together with the sensor, but also how to address uh, psycho-behavioral aspects and motivational aspects in diabetes care. So the wide range of everything what is touching us if we treat people with diabetes so that the colleague in Congo with not enough money to go to a Congress or who cannot achieve to leave its patient from his community health center has the ability to get adequate evidence-based training combined with additional courses and also a master degree. And here an example for the fellowship program. Again, you are all invited to become fellow of the International Diabetes Federation. For those who have a lot of experience in the diabetes sector, there's a senior fellowship. And um, um, uh, scan the QR code, which you see on this slide, and you will find this uh, page currently um, and can indicate with your email address the country we are coming from that you are interested uh, to become fellow. And then we will send you an invitation email in six to eight weeks if the uh, program uh, starts. There's also an individual um, a fellowship program for um, uh, people with a lot of experience. And IDF will become a global community of people for uh, uh, people with diabetes and healthcare professional treating people with diabetes, addressing all the different facets of what is important in diabetes care. So it's a kind of flower in my eyes, bringing together innovation, standards, basic, and motivation and passion for good diabetes care. There will be something else. I will, in negotiation with the small and big companies, also to share their, uh, a little stake from their income for people with diabetes. Don't forget the fellowship and individual membership program. Here again, the QR code. It, I would be extremely happy to find you again as fellow of the International Diabetes Federation or to see you at the Congress in Bangkok and there will be a little fee for the fellowship program. But if you come to the Congress, you will get a discount in uh, in the amount of this fee um, so that you can have a better price for this Congress as well. If you say this is interesting for you, there is on WhatsApp, if you search for the president of the International Diabetes Federation in a WhatsApp channel or on Instagram or on LinkedIn, here are the links. And I will later on also post them in the chat. I would be happy to find you there as well. And let's bring all this together. Let's understand ourselves as a global community of people who have a passion for better treatment of uh, people with diabetes and help our people to walk away from diabetes. So thank you very much. And I apologize for the long uh, introduction. Professor Peter Swartz, that was a power packed, fantastic agenda. Uh, we are really so happy to have you leading IDF in the forefront, and we are really looking forward to work with you hand in hand uh, with the global vision, with the help of technology and beyond. 
So going ahead with our discussion, Professor, uh, my first question to you, and I think uh, many of our uh, colleagues who've been following your activities on the social media platform link that you just shared, uh, we learned you recently had a fantastic trip to many of the Southeast Asian nations. I think it was Sri Lanka as well as Nepal. And now you, you are here with us in India for the weekend. And you had some fruitful interactions with the diabetes care leaders from those countries. So first question to you is, how was that experience of visiting these Southeast Asian nations? What about the unmet needs that you realized that exist in the Southeast Asia country? And then now you're here with us in India. So how do you see India you know, as uh, a diabetes care leader in the Southeast Asia region, as well as in a global perspective? So let me start from the beginning, and actually we should have another three hours to discuss uh, these topics. First, I must say it is totally cool to be here in this region. I started in Sri Lanka, was in Nepal, in several cities uh, in India. Um, it is important, but very passionate to meet the people who have the passion to treat uh, people with diabetes. And especially in Sri Lanka, this was very emotional. Um, because it was the first time that the president of IDF was visiting uh, the colleagues in Sri Lanka. You, you mentioned the unmet need, and this is always a question I'm asking. What is the biggest unmet need um, uh, we have to address or where IDF should act? And uh, the situation in Nepal, Sri Lanka, and India is very different. In uh, Sri Lanka, um, diabetes care is fully covered by the Ministry of Health. But there's a very big number of undiagnosed cases. So the unmet need in Sri Lanka is finding the uh, undiagnosed people uh, with diabetes. And uh, in a TV interview, we have discussed this and we started a campaign for this. But there is a kind of inertia to get diagnosed with diabetes um, because of missing health literacy or also a wrong understanding about the dimension of diabetes. In Nepal, again, the situation is totally different. In Nepal, diabetes care is out of the pocket payment. And um, if the people are diagnosed, um, there is a treatment. But if the treatment goes to insulin, the patient is rejecting this. So there is a big uh, um, resistance about insulin treatment. And um, ultimately, this uh, hyperglycemia increases and there's a high degree of um, diabetes-related kidney disease in Nepal. So uh, two countries, different understand or different circumstances. And now we are in India. And uh, I must honestly say, being in India is always an absolute powerful experience. Because one thing is, the capital, I, I know that I should not say this, um, but I apologize for saying it again. The capital of diabetes is India. 80% of the people with diabetes live in China and India. Uh, a big, big, big fraction is in India with 235 million people with diabetes and prediabetes. So this is a huge number. But I must also say, and this is something where I am um, uh, feel a, a great honor to lead this organization, the two leaders in diabetes care on the professional level, they are in India. And one of the leaders in diabetes care from India is the other expert joining us today here in this session. So it's for me a great honor to learn from these mentors, to learn from these leaders in diabetes care. And especially I mentioned Banshi Shabu. Um, uh, that I can work together with Banshi in the, from uh, uh, April onwards in the board of IDF. But IDF has to change. IDF is still a European organization, but it's not, this is not adequate anymore. Um, the, if IDF wants to have an impact on diabetes care, it has to have this impact in India. And it should also become an Asian or Indian-led organization. Wonderful. Great, great, uh, Peter. Thank you very much for wonderful insights, especially our country needs uh, more leaders as a country is quite big and we have uh, uh, a different kind of ethnicity, we have different kind of problems. So definitely we, we need more leaders and, 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 and mentor like Bansi sir. So uh, with this, I'll, I would like to ask question to Bansi sir that according to the IDF Atlas, the Southeast Asia region accounts for approximately 
a 30% of global diabetes population. Ethnically, how similar are these nations and what are the common problems that can be addressed through IDS Southeast Asia? And, and as you are Southeast Asia region chair elect, what is your uh, say on this, that our country, how they are difficult, uh, different and, and how to address uh, those problems? Thank you, Rutu. And thanks, Amit and Rutu. The idea of, you know, doing this diabetes voice directly on a Facebook, you know, to reaching out to the people with diabetes or those who are taking care of diabetes patients. This is the diabetes voice which we have started as, you know, India is the biggest uh, a country in this Southeast Asia, and we are the leading, and then, you know, the next chair, elect. we thought of that, you know, our problems, we should reach out directly to the patients. We are trying that, you know, how more Bangladesh, people from Nepal, from Sri Lanka, they can also join. And I must congratulate here first Ruthul and Amit for a fantastic idea, not only having an idea, but then to act on it and doing continuously this meeting, you know, to reaching out to the people through social media platform. That's one number one. So I must inform Dr. Peter that this is one activity which we started uh, when I became the chair elect. And since last one and a half years, two years, we are doing continuously. As you know, the voice from IDF means we are trying to say what is the fact and trying to invite the people who are in the field of diabetes. They are experts and they are interacting with the people. So this is one thing. Now, what Rutul has asked, Ask the question very important. And this is the Southeast Asia, which is one third, and already Peter had talked that two third of our diabetic patients between India and China. I always say it is the India as a subcontinent. So, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, they are all the part of India. And once upon a part, they were the part of India also, and divided India were heavy. Unluckily, now Pakistan is not the part of Southeast Asia, but reason wise, in worldwide, we have a similar issue with India and Pakistan. There are challenges and differences also between different regions. Like we have Bhutan and we have Nepal, which is a hilly area, which can be, you know, compared with like a Himachal Pradesh and a Kashmir Valley of India. And they will have a similar type of challenges, what we have in Nepal and Bhutan. And if you see the Bangladesh, which is like our Bengal or Assam, which is very typical of other states of India with the language, with the food habits, they are like that. And you can compare Sri Lanka with our Chennai or Tamil Nadu population. We have with us with Maldives or Mauritius, which are like our Goa or Lakshadweep or Andaman or Nicobar. So, you know, whatever we have in India, some of our reasons can be compared with these, you know, other countries who are also the part of India subcontinent and they are part of our Southeast Asia. So we have many similarities with them and we have many challenges which are common with us. But one slightly dissimilar, which I can say the Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, these are the two countries where diabetes and primarily I'm talking of diabetes and other health issues related to the non-communicable disease are, many of them are taken care directly by the government. In Bangladesh now, each district is taken care directly. They have a Bangladesh Diabetic Society and this burden, you know, they are directly connected with multiple medical college, institute, their state and their province and their district have a direct coordination and they get the treatment and therapy directly from the government, which is almost free of charge. And the same condition is Sri Lanka. Unluckily, currently the situation in Sri Lanka and in Bangladesh both have a lot of turmoil and a lot of issues. And that may be the challenge for their patients also. Like, you know, when Sri Lanka was in a problem, uh, we try to help them by sending even the insulin also for type 1 children. The Nepal is again a different situation. Together, as insulin fear is there all over the world. It is more in Indian subcontinent and there out of that, you can see the Nepalese population have more problems. Bhutan have a other unique issue. They don't have any NGO. There is no NGO in Bhutan and that's the reason they are not becoming the part of this idea of Southeast Asia or International Diabetic Federation because there is nothing like a diabetes Bhutan. Even our chair, Dr. Ajat Khan, had personally visited and then we decided once again to visit uh, Bhutan to make them part of idea of International Diabetic Federation. 
the challenges are there that we are getting highest number of diabetes prevalence is increasing we are getting diabetes in early 30s and 40s that's a big challenge we are more sarcopenic we are highly uh, fat uh, thin fat highly insulin resistant we need therapy which is going to take care of our pancreatic dysfunction along with insulin sensitizer both to be combined we need insulin therapy early in the course of diabetes we develop more cardiovascular disease our complications are higher we are also developing higher ckd so we need our metabolic profile is not similar like what caucasian population is having we have even at the lean or uh, mass is less our uh, bmi at the 25 26 we develop diabetes and many of them developing cardiovascular disease one more problem is we have more tobacco consumption not cigarette which is the tobacco which is eating tobacco is a challenge for us we are more sedentary even i was surprised yesterday peter was showing the average german is walking only 2570 <laughs> steps and today morning when i was in the club i just tried to ask that everyone what is your average steps and those who are coming for a regular walk and exercise they are also walking averagely only 4000 to 6000 steps but if i go and then i met some of the people in my office and uh, at residence and then i realized that actually they are walking less than 1500 steps per day so you know peter we will uh, you know show you some more data and we will publish it also it was really very interesting and we were discussing yesterday also with you and rutul then we will publish from our city also that what is the average person who is walking so that we are more sedentary we maybe you cannot say lazy but we are more sedentary and we had become more centrally obese you know you had shown the data that we have 235 million people with pre diabetes and diabetes but in india one more problem is 353 million people who are centrally obese it means their bmi may not be more than 25 but their abdominal girth is more than half of their height is 353 million people it means they are at the risk of developing diabetes they are at the risk of developing MSLD, they are at the risk of developing cardiovascular disease, and something which, if we have to prevent diabetes, cardiovascular disease, for which we are meeting tomorrow in Mumbai for World Congress of Prevention of Diabetes, our primary aim to identify these people who are at the risk of developing diabetes. We have Indian Diabetes Risk Score also, and we can modify them to prevent diabetes. And this we want to do in complete Southeast Asia, in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, in Maldives, and everywhere. and the other challenge is the type of care the technology uses in our part of the world is really less in compared to western pacific area or even in mina region because some of the countries in mina are very rich but we can compare somewhere in africa as far as type of care is concerned and that we want to improve as a southeast asia chair my patient is there that more technology we should use in our country in other countries of southeast asia we should improve the care for type 1 diabetes and we should see that the type 1 index should improve in next 5 to 10 years then they should have a normal life at present many of them are dying in their 30s and 40 so that our goal that we should change in next decade that is what we want to see in our southeast asia is uh, thank you very much uh, bansi sir for Uh, insights of uh, southeast asia region what are the challenges how different our region is and my next question is to uh, peter that as the president of idf uh, you have passionately championed the vision of uh, bringing diabetes care directly into hands of every individual through technology and and uh, digital and and uh, social media uh, that you were talking about so as a staunch advocate for diabetes technology how do you see this vision becoming a reality uh, thank you very much for this question i must say i'm a big fan of digitalization not in the hands only but in the pocket of the patient uh, with diabetes um if we assume every one of us is taking 1800 decisions a day 450 of these decisions are related to our lifestyle. Now imagine we use smartphone-based therapeutics, so apps on the smartphone, but not only gamification apps or something like that, but intelligent, maybe AI-supported, evidence-based 
digital therapeutics and they do in the right moment with the right motivational message with the right content they set impulses to influence only 10 out of the 450 decisions per day but do it over one year so this can work actually without that the patient recognizes that he is in a diabetes program but this may translate it into 10 kilogram of weight reduction um, uh, over the period of a year or, for example, to a gain in muscle mass, which especially in the Indian um, uh, subtype of diabetes is of direct benefit uh, to the patient. So I'm fascinated by the digitalization, not because it's cool to have a smartphone, because we never have been so close to our patient than being in the pocket of the patient. But now we as healthcare professionals must rethink Yeah, in the past. We prescribed a drug and the patient came to us if he had a problem. Now we are constantly 24-7 with the patient and should think how we can use this power and rethink behavioral and motivational strategies delivered by the smartphone. So digitalization is for me not a new kind of diabetes care. It's a new delivery channel where we deliver behavioral associated di modern innovative diabetes care and now let's go a step ahead think about ai yeah ai will with the upcoming months become better and better and better and there is for example in sweden a development of an ai driven digital diabetes therapeutic which is like the diabetologist out of the pocket these apps tells the patient exactly at what hour a day the patient should inject how many units of insulin or when to take the drugs and what physical activity is good and it uses an intelligent way to motivate the patient for more physical activity. Um, and now we could say, oh, no, we, we don't want this because we are physicians and we want to take care about our patient. I'm thinking about countries like Rwanda. There are 350,000 patients with diabetes and one endocrinologist. So, um, and the digital infrastructure in Rwanda is better than in Europe. So there are regions in the world where digitalization can be a, a game changer for people with diabetes. And this is where I'm passionate um, about. But we also have to accept there will be patients who not at all wants to touch an app, who have no digital literacy. So we will not reach every patient with it. But this gives us a chance to concentrate our routine work on those patients who really need more attention from us and those patients who uh, uh, are happy and are well treated using digital tools, they can go ahead with this. So we should not fear this. We, we should take this in our hands and we should be the driver of digitalization and diabetes care. We should not leave it to Google or Meta or Alphabet. We should be the one. We, uh, uh, we should be the frontier in using digitalization and diabetes care. That's a fantastic viewpoint, Peter. And that's that's what we keep saying that, you know, yeah. we are gradually shifting from the era of just evidence-based medicine to data-driven intelligence-based medicine. And with you on the forefront, I'm sure there are brighter days ahead. And we also believe that technology is here to stay. And the true essence will be when it's going to be affordable, available, and accessible to one and all. Yeah. And I'm sure with the vision that you share with the diabetes care being in everybody's pocket through IDF and IDF Southeast Asia, I think that dream is going to come true very soon for every diabetes individual. Thank you very much for those inputs. Dr. Sabo, I'll move on to you with one very important question. And as you rightly said, that this weekend we will be in the city of Mumbai uh, uh, discussing on prevention of diabetes in a Congress, and uh, it's a World Congress. And we understand that pre-diabetes is so, so very important. And there's a huge prevalence of pre-diabetes in the Southeast Asia region, as much as it's there in our country, India. For the general public audience at large who's listening to us today, uh, could you just give us your thoughts on pre-diabetes, why it is so important, and what steps we can take on behalf of IDF Southeast Asia collectively? So one is that pre-diabetes have all the risk for someone to develop the problem. So it is as risky as someone is becoming diabetic and the chances of getting cardiovascular disease, they are almost equivalent with someone with pre-diabetes. So one is, it also gives you an opportunity to prevent them from pre-diabetes. That's the second one. But in my clinical practice, I always understand that even someone who is at the risk of developing diabetes, 
you must understand that he is also at the risk of developing coronary arteries. This too, even he had not done the diabetes. So you have to intervene all those things. You have to do all those things to prevent him from cardiovascular disease or preventing him to become diabetic also. And that's how the importance of metabolic syndrome had come. Because they have all metabolic risk factors. Whether it's a dyslipidemia, whether it's a hypertension, whether it's a central obesity, whether you are calling it sarcopenia, you call it more fat percentage, or even some of them may have even the higher uh, insulin resistance also, and they have some of them have pre-diabetes too. Yesterday, Peter had shown very interesting data. Even with the persons with a normal HbA1c, they put on a continuous glucose monitor. And what we found that, you know, some of the time, these also have a peak in throughout the 24 hours. And then we had tried to show that these are the ones who should be picked up. It's not that the CGM should be used for the diagnosis, but even in the early course of yeah. diabetes, when their HbA1c is absolutely normal, even less than 6, less than 5.9, where they cannot be called even a pre-diabetes patient, 5.7. But still, we can do many things for these people to prevent them to become diabetes. And not only for when we are going to prevent all those things, you will be also preventing them from developing cardiovascular disease. And for that, you know, tomorrow we are going to have a brainstorming with all the experts from all over the world who will be meeting for this World Congress of Prevention of Diabetes, so pre-conference, we are going to meet and going to come out with a guideline. This is Dr. Ram Chandan and many of the experts are part of it, including me. And we'll be publishing it from India as well as from uh, WCPD and IDF as a position statement. Too. So with this, I mean, the pre-diabetic population, which is increasing in our country, I'm sure same condition is there with Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And we also have a lot of people who are at the risk of developing diabetes. Let us do something that we can prevent them from getting diabetes. And this WCPD will definitely create an impact to all Indian diabetologists that we should try to think of prevention of diabetes more rather than just treating diabetes. Fantastic. Preventing pre-diabetes to progress into diabetes. And perhaps then we can be the diabetes care capital of the world across, yeah. across the globe in Southeast Asia region. Uh, so, Dr. Peter, uh, for all these preventions, we need education. And, and one of the, the, the biggest asset of IDF and vision of IDF has been in capacity building and imparting education, not just in healthcare professionals, but also in the community and patient as large, at, at large. And such is one hour initiative here through this Facebook Live episode. And there is an initiative of IDF which is the idea of school, which you already showed in your presentation. And we have a lot of our healthcare professionals connected through this live session across India and across the globe and Southeast Asia. So could you elaborate about how could a healthcare professional uh, get more specialized education through the IDF school and also a little bit more highlight on the fellowship program that you spoke about? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, first, the IDF school is a very... Uh, intuitive and practical, I could say, product of IDF um, was founded, actually, it is an Indian initiative, we must say, and is about, um, I think it's about eight years old, so started eight years ago, and, and until today, more than 100,000 healthcare professionals, I think it's 103,000 healthcare professionals were uh, tr uh, trained by the IDF School of Diabetes. So it's a, it's a big success story. And um, the strength of the IDF school is that as a healthcare professional or as a diabetes educator, you can get certain courses. These are maybe then 11 or even 20 modules. So then each module builds on the successful um, participation of the previous module. But then there are also a singular mod, uh, modules um, talking about depression, talking about the use of a glucose sensor and so on. Some of them are animated. Some of them are more in a lecture style. And uh, today you have about 100 modules. I want to extend this to a degree of, let's say, in three years, 1,000 modules covering everything what is relevant in diabetes care. And in a very intuitive way that none of the healthcare professionals should get the feeling, oh, no, this is too complicated. We want to do it very easy, very simple to start, very intuitive. But we also want to go to the level 
um, um, that a researcher or well-experienced diabetologist still gets a new innovation in diabetes care. So the, the whole spectrum of uh, diabetes education should be addressed. And um, there will be in the future modules also, for example, how to found uh, or start your own diabetes clinic. So uh, even business-like uh, modules, because this is also important to develop new strategies in care pathways. If I would criticize the school, I would say the school is good for healthcare professional education. The school is not good yet in patient education. And if I'm in many countries and ask, Un, um, what is an unmet need often comes education, 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 and nine from 10 words is education for the patient. One out of 10 is education for the physician. So the education of the patient is one of the big objectives during my presidency ship. And uh, I already told you, this will be the pocket of every diabetes patient. You also mentioned the fellowship program. Um, uh, my goal is because we have on a global scale about 1.2 million people treating patients with diabetes. And I want to build a community or IDF wants to build a global community of um, uh, these healthcare professionals. If we look into different countries, many of the health, or I would say all of the healthcare professionals have a big passion to do good diabetes care. But as I said, there's often a lack of continuous education. And I want to bring the education for free for the fellows of the International Diabetes Federation into their office. And it doesn't matter, is it Tanzania in a rural area or is it Congo in the capital or is it Finland um, uh, on, a, on a ship or, or somewhere so that we um, reduce all the barriers to access high quality evidence-based education and diabetes care. And at the end, if we improve the skills of the healthcare professionals worldwide, they provide better care, they reach more patients, they can deliver better care, and this will improve the quality of diabetes care for all of our patients. So a big invitation. Um, uh, you've, uh, I think you shared already the QR code. Register your interest for the fellowship program and uh, follow us on the social media about the strategies of IDF, because then we will always give an update about this. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, so uh, I have already shared it in many of the groups. This thank you very much. Definitely, we are going to get good response. Uh, so I have next question for Dr. Bansi Sabu. Uh, are you here? I guess. So we can go with the next question so, with Dr. Yeah, Peter. Can, and then, yeah, 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 of course. So, uh, Peter, we have a question that the theme of IDF World Diabetes Day 24-26 is uh, diabetes and well-being. How important is this holistic well-being for diabetes individual beyond their glucose control? What advice would you give to our viewers with respect to quality of life and diabetes care? As yesterday, we were discussing about a, a blue index. This is kind of a yeah, comprehensive yeah. Uh, score. Uh, and, and this is uh, all about quality of life, uh, uh, quality of care and uh, well-being. So what would yeah. you say to our viewers? At the end, well-being is a different term to quality of life. And if you are honest, if what is driving us in our life, it's quality of life. But again, if we ask someone in Bhutan, in Finland, in India, or Latin America, or if we ask a young lady or an old man, quality of life means very, very different things. And if we want to provide a good diabetes care, this may include lifestyle changes, or um, we call it also self-management. And this self-management, the patient will only adhere to it if uh, the patient recognizes that quality of life improves. But this is not diabetes-specific. This is how we are made. This is how we think, how we behave, how we live. Quality of life is the, the strongest source of changing something, but also the strongest source of resistance or inertia because if we feel that it's good and we are relaxed, if we sit on the sofa, there's no motivation to do physical activity. So we have to connect quality of life 
with adherence to a good, I will not say only diabetes, NCD management or NCD trend, non-communicable diseases, so all the metabolic diseases. And um, if I'm talking about this, for many people, it may, it may sound, ah, this is this is not very targeted. It's not very clear. It's not very specific. Because quality of life is so different. But it's our big partner. It's our big part in our life what is driving us. And any idea which helps to connect good um, uh, quality of care with quality of life, yeah, will drive the field forward. And what I'm always saying, I had a chance in uh, in Delhi to talk to a school with uh, there were about 700 or 800 children in the room and young children. And what I told them, good treatment or good lifestyle and good eating habits, it's a kind of respect to your own body, respect to your health. And if we translate this, this means quality of life for me. So maybe the term respect to your health is easier digestible than quality of life because it's so different from us. But respect is something everyone was of uns wants to get. So we also should give to our body, to our health, um, to our, at the end, disease treatment. So rightly said, uh, Dr. Peter, that importance and respect to your own health is actually a quality of life. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and we have next question to Dr. Bansi Sabu that, and it, it is one of the important question for our region, as well as you have worked tremendously in this uh, uh, field that insulin availability and affordability has always been a challenge in Southeast Asia region and in our nations, especially for type 1 diabetes individuals. So how has the different Southeast Asia region nations addressed this issue? How can IDF Southeast Asia uh, as a community reach out to policymakers and society at large to address this need gap? And then you are also working closely with the government now. So how do you see this insulin availability and affordability in our region and country? So access and availability both is a challenge, particularly the insulin. As India is a very large country, and the similar issues may be at the Nepal because of hilly region and some of the places in you know, the rural area of Nepal where the things may not be available, the doctor is not available. And, you know, typhoon can happen anyway. The challenges which I know it at Maldives, you know, Maldives is a country with 700 island, with more than 300 island people are staying. And they have to travel from one island to other island only through uh, that water uh, port system. I mean, that again a challenge for them. So we know that these are the challenges, the access and availability. And the third thing which you talk about the same is the affordability for this. Some of the countries, as I already told you, the Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, they are trying to provide it. They are providing the free insulin too also. In the India also with the advocacy which we have created in the last 20 years, one thing I can tell you that most of the tertiary care government hospital, tertiary care, I'm not saying the primary care, insulin is available. What is not available is the education. They are given the insulin. The pharmacists sometimes they provide the insulin, but they don't know whether they are giving the person a premix or a analog mix or a long acting analog or short acting. And that creates a lot of confusion to the patient. So we need that all tertiary care hospital, at least they should have a dedicated type for clinic. And they can be connected with the CHC, with the community health care center with the online system also. And this model has already been started working in the West Bangal. And the same model which we are going to replicate in other states, like in Gujarat, we are working very efficiently. And probably maybe in a few months, we will show that the same model will work also. Because it may not be possible a specialist will be available in all those rural areas. Because even a one patient need a specialist care. So how it is possible? With the idea of telehealth and telemedication, consultation, all those things are possible. And that patient can be also given the insulin. The same thing which we have done during COVID time, when patients were not able to reach out to us and we provided them insulin also at their doorstep too. This is what through the trust and charity, 
We are working with many international organizations, including SPAD, Life for Child, CDIC, that is Changing Diabetes in Children, and some of the international organizations also, and the local organizations who are helping us, supporting us to provide free insulin, glucose meter, the strips. What I say from IDF, from Diabetes India, or any organization who is working for type 1, what we can provide as a doctor, I think we can provide the education. A type 1 need very good structure education. He needs four-time injection, which may the government may provide. Sometimes the care provider can provide, the healthcare, uh, I mean the caregiver can provide. But education can be provided only by the doctors or a healthcare professional who is interested in type 1 care. If we give them a proper structured education, if they are measuring their sugar four times a day, if they they corrected insulin dose accordingly, correction dose, if they know the insulin curve calculation properly, if they take basal and bolus, we know from 40 years the necessity had proved it that we can achieve a tight glycemic control. At that time, there was no insulin pump, no continuous glucose monitoring. Only thing which was available was glucose meter, NPH, and a regular insulin. Now we have better insulin, better glucose meter, better strips at a less price. If we can do that much, our patients can survive for a good quality of life for a long period of life instead of they are dying in their 30s and 40s. So this data we have since last 40 years. Probability problem is we are not utilizing them. So same thing we have to do. Yes, those 20% patients who can afford, give them best of the best therapy, give them best technology to use, give them best continuous glucose meter, give them a insulin pump, all those things which are available in the world, they can be provided also. But other 80% people should be given all those things which is easily available. And I don't know. Now, regarding cost, I must tell here, uh, in front of idea of president, probably we are one in India who are making the cheapest medicine in the world. We are having the, uh, you know, the dapagliflozin is costing uh, 10 tablet of dapagliflozin costing less than $1. That is what India is providing. We are having the glargin insulin, which is available to us. We have the short-acting insulin analog, which is made in India and which is also available at a much cheaper rate in compared to what the Western world they are selling. So it's not like that we are costly. But yes, for some of the patients, it is still there. So poor, they can't afford this also. And where we are trying and doing with advocacy and helping them also, providing them free insulin from the government or from some of the NGO. But I always see, there is a lot of opportunity for all of us. We all doctors in India. We have a lot of opportunity to serve the society because society is underserved or many poor people are there. If suppose you are in Germany, probably you will not have that opportunity to serve those poor people because you don't have those poor people who can't afford uh, insulin or you have to provide them insulin. But in India, you have that opportunity. And I always say that all 100,000 physicians who are working in India, taking care of many patients of diabetes, they have opportunity for prevention, for increasing awareness, for giving them good therapy, for preventing their complications. If they are interested in type 1, they can also take care of many of these children and giving them a good quality of life. And I think they can get blessings from society of the same. Thank you. I think those are fantastic visions from the chair-elect of ID of Southeast Asia. And it's true that we need to be we need to have solutions which are affordable and always accessible, and that should come with, with the right approach. Dr. Peter, uh, we had a fantastic session today, and we are almost at the end of our session. We had brainstorming thoughts coming in from both of you. But as I said in the beginning of this, of this episode, that we will be taking up at least one question from our large audience viewers that has been connected with us today. And here is this question from Dr. Hitesh from the city of Delhi. And he wants to know that diabetes care has been evolving rapidly. There's been a paradigm change happening, especially with the use of technology. So it's no longer glucocentric, it's more organocentric, more metrics are coming in. And now we have technology and AI coming in. As a young diabetologist, how do you how do you recommend a young diabetologist or an endocrinologist should prepare themselves with this paradigm change coming? in the field of diabetes care and how 
how do they see, they see themselves in the next five to ten years as a diabetologist? What are your suggestions? So, yeah, thank you very much. This is a very good question. I remember also the uh, evening yesterday. There were uh, maybe fifty young diabetologists. And I told them, you are the future leader in diabetes care. This is number one. Um, see yourself as a future leader, as a young leader in diabetes care. Um, will, it work, will it really be a paradigm shift? Um, as you asked the question, I had the feeling, no, I think it's not a paradigm shift. Technology will be a disruptive innovation. But I wouldn't say we change our treatment paradigms. The, the the goals in diabetes care will stay the same. Less glucocentric, um, as you say, more focused on uh, different organs, behavior of the patient, motivational aspects, self-management aspects. But this is not nothing new. This is known since a long time. Technology will change. And technology will help us to understand the disease better. Um, for example, the availability of sensors have told us um, eight, ten years ago that diabetes is actually a different disease than we always believed. Uh, as Banshee this already mentioned, yeah, the, using sensors in pre-diabetic individuals, in healthy individuals, this uh, gives us a new opportunity to reach a clientele which we um, uh, were not able to reach before. But what we are doing with them is the same evidence in diabetes care in the past. So uh, this, I would translate this, be prepared for the new technology. And today, glucose sensors are still expensive, but uh, in yeah. three years, I think it will be less than $10 for two weeks, and in five years, less than $1 for two weeks. And then we can use this sensor technology widely. And um, the strength of the sensor is that it gives an immediately feedback to the patient about his eating habit and the glycemic load. And this will change the understanding of the patient about the disease. So the, the level of discussion to the patient will vary. And I clearly would recommend to the young colleagues, understand your self as a leader in diabetes care, as a frontier to use the technology not only to measure glucose, but to use the technology to provide better, timely, earlier care to the patient. Other aspects of technology like AID systems or the use of AI, this also will come. And here also I would say, don't fear it, be prepared, use it, try it, try it again if you failed and uh, develop your very own, very individual model of providing diabetes care. Listen to the teachers and the mentors, and build your own model, build your own concept, and then you will be successful. Fantastic. I think those are fantastic views uh, coming in. And I think we all are going to be evolving with, uh, with what is happening around us with technology coming in. And I think IDF School is taking fantastic initiative on that ground in taking uh, special modules on CGM. And I think uh, other technologies will also be involved uh, you know, as, as we go ahead. Uh, we had a fantastic session. Uh, and while we go to the end of, of, this, uh, of this episode today, and I hand it back to my dear friend, Dr. Rutul, uh, for closing, uh, Dr. Peter, we would like you to give your closing comments to all our viewers and also what are we awaiting at the IDF Bangkok 2025? It will be a very cool Congress. Come and discuss. Don't only listen, discuss, uh, find controversies, discuss with the other people, discuss with the speakers. And as I said in the previous statement, Prepare yourself as the future leader in diabetes care. This is what I would like to give uh, everyone home. And uh, in my own interest, uh, look at the links we have shared on uh, the WhatsApp channel, the Instagram and the LinkedIn uh, post, and, and also the QR code for the fellowship program. Use this because this is your road to become a leader, a future leader in diabetes care. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, 
Peter, as we have already started this work, and, and definitely as uh, we have a very big group of uh, D-geniuses yesterday, we were discussing about it is under the umbrella of uh, Diabetes India, and we have more than uh, 500 doctors, young diabetologists and endocrinologists uh, uh, in, in that group, and, and we are working actively for this group. So definitely we are going to share everything to everyone personally as well, and we are going to recommend them this all stuff and we are meeting in uh, in person tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, then also we are going to discuss about that. Uh, so with this, uh, we would like to be really thankful to you for wonderful insights and, and giving us the chance to discuss about uh, IDF uh, Southeast Asia region's problem and challenges and 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 how to overcome and and uh, thank you very much for motivating and, and saying that yes we are the future leader as all diabetologists who are watching this live they are really motivated today and and definitely we are coming uh, out there in front and, and we are going to play uh, a, a big role we will try to be, play the big role in diabetes care thank you very much again uh, and and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining and, and watching us live. And, and we'll see you next month as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you. Night. Good night.